Good to see everyone this evening. We'll begin our service by singing hymn number, well, where'd I put it, Dan? 151, 151, Hiding in Thee. B-151. <clears throat> Oh, save to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly, so sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be, thou blessed rock of age. I'm hiding in thee, hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee, in the calm of the noontide in sorrow's lone hour, in times when temptation cast o'er me its power, in the tempest of life on its wide heavenly sea, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. When pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, have I hidden in thee, O thou rock of my soul. Hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Very good. In terms of announcements, they're pretty simple. Uh, of course, Tuesday morning, men meet here at a time at 8.30 in the morning for a time of praise and fellowship. If you can make that, that's always good. Wednesday continues to be our prayer and Bible study at 7 o'clock. And, of course, the youngsters are meeting downstairs at night. Thursday is Mommy and Me. And, of course, Sunday will be the same service as starting at 10 o'clock in the morning with Sunday school and the morning worship immediately following. Choir practice continues, and we practice tonight after it seemed like an eternity. We've been off, <laughs> but it was good. We got some good songs, and we're just praising the Lord together. So that's wonderful. And, of course, the evening service remains the same. In terms of anything else, the ladies' tea and girls' tea will be on the April 20th. That's a Saturday. 10 o'clock a.m. The theme is Good Deed Doers. Refreshments will be provided, and there's a sign-up sheet for that in the back. And, of course, uh, I don't know of any other special announcements that maybe I'm missing or whatever, but the normal assignments are in the bulletin if you would have any desire to look at them. Uh, we're going to sing a song that I just heard this morning. That was a it was a blessing to me I, because I, I I knew the tune. I just didn't I didn't know what song it is. We're going to turn to hymn number three hundred and thirty eight. I knew the tune, and it kind of goes on to another. There's a group called the Hoppers that sing this song as the beginning of one of their other songs, and and it kind of goes together. But it's a great song. It says, "Come, ye sinners, poor and needy." Three thirty eight. Uh, whatever we were when we came to Jesus Christ as Savior, we were certainly poor. 
in spirit. And we were certainly needy of a Savior. And that's a wonderful thing to never forget as a Christian. We have come a long way because of what Jesus has done for us. Let's sing together, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. Together. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Amen on the second. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty glorify true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you nigh i will arise and go to jesus he will embrace me in his arms in the arms of my dear savior Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry, you'll be better. You will never come at home. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Wonderful on the last. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in his arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. How many of you have sung that before? Let me see, there's only like... I guess I'm the one that lost out. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Great song, great message. Well, good evening. Good to see you this evening, and uh, that's a wonderful third. Well, all the verses there are great, and you know, I was looking through it. It's one I've heard. I don't know if I've sung it or not, um, but it was saying that if you tarry till you're better, if you wait until you're better, you're never going to come. You're never going to um, come to Christ if you wait until you think you're good enough. So uh, tremendous hymn and, and a great one for us to learn. Um, if we can begin this evening by going to Jude, and we're just going to read verse 25 uh, for the moment, Jude 25. I want our focus to be on the Lord this evening, and, and as it always should be, but we're going to consider a few things tonight that are a little bit different, and so I want us to begin here by reading this wonderful um, description of uh, God and of our Savior in Jude, verse 25, it says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 
Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you uh, again for the opportunity to gather and sing your praises, and we thank you for just the, the great hymns of the faith that, that teach us. And uh, Lord, we pray tonight that you would give us an understanding of your word and how we make application to the culture and times around us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a number of subjects and Bible subjects, topics, and cultural things that have been on my mind that I feel like as a pastor, as a preacher, it needed to be addressed, things that are going on around us. But I'm always very careful not to chase headlines. You know, I like to prayerfully choose a book, and then we go to chapter 1, verse 1, and then we stick with it until the book is done. But like I said, there's a number of things going on that, that raise genuine and necessary questions for us. And so I wanted to uh, begin going through some of these things. And for the most part, they will be connected. And it's always going to be drawing from Scripture. The questions about culture and time are never going to be answered by the culture and by the times we're in. And so we want to look at the world around us, consider the things that are confronting us as believers, and then find the answer in God's Word. And so for one of uh, anything else I could think of, the title for this series is going to be What on Earth is God Doing? Because I think with a lot of these things that we see around us, I see essentially Christians asking that question, what on earth is God doing? And it may be asked in the sense of, I know he's doing something, I just don't understand. It may be in the sense of, this just doesn't seem right, how could God allow this to happen? It may be looking at it from a prophetical standpoint and saying, what's happening now, what's going to happen next? And this evening, we're going to see in Deuteronomy that there are times when we have to step back and we say, you know what, the secret things belong to the Lord, and we just don't know. And we have to, as we saw this morning, we just have to trust. We just have to leave it in the Lord's hands. But where there is an answer in the Bible, we need to know that answer so that we can make application in our lives and even without everything that happened in Israel yesterday, there's a lot of questions about what the nature of Israel is and what God's meaning and, and purpose for the nation of Israel is. And you would be maybe surprised by how many people don't even consider that Israel still exists in terms of a, a genetic people descended from Abraham. And so I, I wanted to look at some of these things and, and considering what happened yesterday, I wanted to kind of base some thoughts around what the Bible teaches about the, the, the battles that are going to happen, uh, referred to as Gog and Magog. And so before we get into that, I want us to just take a moment and, and just pray for what's happening in Israel. Uh, you know, many of you, I'm sure everybody knows by now about the attack that took place yesterday. And as we deal with these things, it's, it's not entirely possible to avoid the political, but I want to consider it from the biblical perspective. Uh, and so regardless of what anyone may think about Israel, you know, the attack that happened and, and the, the battles that have been raging, uh, you know, for a long, long time are certainly worth praying for. As if it was any other nation in the world, we certainly do and, and would pray for their physical safety. Um, I think, you know, last I read two, three hundred drones and missiles being fired from Iran over into Israel. And so uh, much to be concerned about and to pray for. And so uh, let's pray for that immediate situation and then look to the Bible for what it teaches us as to what our perspective can be. So let's just pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening again that we can be here. And, and Lord, we uh, sit here in, in so much safety. Uh, Lord, such that we can easily take it for granted. Uh, and yet there are uh, terrible things happening in, all around the world, Lord, and we have been praying for the situation with Ukraine and Russia, uh, Lord, parts of Africa with conflicts where there have been uh, upwards of a million deaths and, and millions more that have been displaced. Uh, Lord, we know of so many other things happening in the world today, and, and we do, uh, Lord, seek uh, your peace to be in this world, and we seek that through these uh, tragedies that there would be those who are turned to considering the gospel. Uh, but Lord, this evening we particularly want to bring before you the need of, of Israel, uh, and Lord, we uh, would just pray that they would know protection and peace. Lord, we ask that you would uh, turn them to yourself, that they would trust in uh, Jesus and be saved. 
And Lord, it's our prayer for all those nations around them to be saved as well. We know that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, And so, Lord, in this current conflict, we do seek for peace. But, Lord, we understand that until you return, the Prince of Peace, that there won't be anything lasting in this world. But, Lord, as we are here in the time we're given and the opportunity that we're afforded, may we be peacemakers. And so, Father, we look to you now uh, to bless uh, your people and, Lord, to bring salvation uh, to all those who would turn to you. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I wanted to begin by looking at what the Bible says about Gog and Magog. And some of this is going to be looking at it from the perspective of there's so much false teaching that's out there and so much error that I want us to make sure that we are grounded in everything we believe in God's word. And if I share something that I've seen online, I, I, you know, I'm not picking on anybody here, okay? I, I, I can't think off the top of my head of anyone who's just kind of liked and shared something on Facebook and I'm like, got to fix that. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that. I deliberately steer away from that. Uh, so I want us to make sure that we're rooting everything that we believe in God's word so that we don't go astray, so that we don't end up end- having contradictions in our understanding of the Bible. And so the first thing, that I, the first place I want to start is by pointing to the fact that in Genesis chapter 12, God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Now, because this is going to be coming up in our study of the life of Abraham shortly, I don't want to go through it too much tonight. I just want to establish a few basic points. And the primary point I wanted to make is that it's an everlasting covenant. And on the surface of it, if I said to you, how long is everlasting? Well, kind of the answer's in the name. If something is eternal, then how long does it last for eternity? It may be something that we can band together and sue the battery makers, you know, the the everlasting batteries, because they don't last forever. You know, there are things, sometimes there are words thrown around that kind of lose their meaning because they don't live up to their description But when God makes an everlasting, eternal covenant, which is the way it's described numerous times all the way through the Bible, well, then that means something. There's a friend of mine who's fond of saying that words mean something. And God's word especially means what it says. And so in Genesis chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Uh, within this covenant, there are several elements. There is the personal things pertaining to Abraham, particularly his name has been made great. And there are, you know, few places around the world where the name of Abraham is is not known. There are national blessings. So there were things promised particularly to Israel as a nation that don't pertain to any other nation in the world. And then there is the global It says, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, all the families of the earth be blessed. And that is speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, if we go over to Genesis chapter 13, uh, we see that there is an expansion or there is another mention of the covenant in Genesis 13, 15. He says, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I know I'm kind of skipping along kind of quickly, but like I said, we're going to be digging into this in more detail very soon, Sunday mornings. But in Genesis chapter 15, uh, if we pick up in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it, him, it, counted it to him for righteousness." 
He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the other counties to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall I come with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Uh, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoke and furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kesenazites and the Cabanites, the Hittites and the Perizzites, and the Rephians and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergeshites and the Jebusites. And as you go through that passage, I know it's kind of a long reading, but the primary section there to see is in the covenant that was uh, established through not just the word, the promise of the Lord, but the sacrifices that took place. And the way that covenants had said would normally happen is that both would pass through the sacrifices together. But here we see that God alone passed through. And so the responsibility of the covenant was upon God himself. And there was no responsibility upon Abraham. And when you go through the other mentions of this covenant, you know, 17 and uh, verse 21, he says, my covenant will I establish with Isaac. And so it goes on. And for the sake of time tonight, we're not going to dig into it any further, but it's plain to see with every mention, you can go to Deuteronomy 30 and read that. It is an everlasting covenant. And so the promises made to Israel are made to Abraham and his descendants. And the important thing that I just want to emphasize here is that the church does not replace Israel. The church did not become Israel. In Romans 9, 10, and 11, it describes it so well. And in chapter 11, it says that, you know, the, the church was grafted in, but it didn't replace it. It says that the times of the Gentiles occur until a set point, And then God will again turn his attention to Israel as a nation. And so you have this everlasting covenant made with the descendants of, of Abraham as well as Abraham. And we see that this morning, even looking at Abraham, the friend of God, when Jehoshaphat would come along and he would say, you made a covenant with your friend, Abraham. And then in Isaiah, God said, I've made a covenant with my friend, Abraham. And so it continues. It goes on through the Bible. It is an everlasting covenant. And so there is a future for Israel. The people descended from Abraham. The next thing I want us to deal with is there is an expected conflict. Uh, now, I want to be clear about what is clear, and I want to leave room for God to do what he's going to do where I'm not clear, if that makes sense. I don't know if that was a disclaimer that confused or it helped. There are things in the Bible that are very clear. There are other things where good people disagree. But there is definitely an expected conflict that is going to take place. So if we go over, first of all, to uh, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 38, one of the key principles with any prophecy, with any promise that God makes is, has it happened? Has it been fulfilled? If it hasn't been fulfilled, and if God hasn't plainly stated, well, actually, no, I'm going to fulfill it in a different way. Well, then we know it's a prophecy that's yet to occur. How do we know if a promise is a prophecy? Well, if it hasn't happened yet. And so we can look forward to it sometime in the future. And so this expected conflict I want us to think about for a moment is that that's referred to as Gog and Magog. Now, who here has heard of Gog and Magog? Okay, so quite a few people are, you know, you've heard of the terminology. I believe, and again, this is where some people may disagree with me, but I think there are two conflicts 
that are referred to or use the terminology Gog and Magog. And I believe one of them happens probably before the tribulation, and the other one happens at the end of the millennial kingdom. So we're in the, the, the time of the church now. We're in the days of grace, and, and then I believe the rapture will happen next. Following the rapture are seven years of tribulation on the earth. The tribulation serves the purpose of turning Israel back to himself, and it also is a final opportunity for people to acknowledge that God exists and for them to turn to him and be saved. And in the book of Revelation, it says that during the tribulation, a great multitude will be saved. But it's also a time of punishment upon those who reject God and want to destroy the people of God. At the end of the tribulation, you have the second coming when Jesus returns with his saints in Revelation 19, and he establishes his kingdom upon the earth. It's a thousand-year kingdom, and it doesn't end after a thousand years, but at the end of the thousand years, in Revelation 20, I believe there's a, another conflict where the, the term Gog and Magog is used, and then there's a new heavens and a new earth, and the kingdom of the Lord continues forever. And so... Uh, this uh, event here, Gog and Magog, some people believe it occurs during the tribulation. I believe it may begin, you know, before or right at the beginning of it. And I'll explain why as we go along. Now, a very fair question, even if you're familiar with it, but if you're not familiar with it, is what on earth is Gog and Magog? Uh, they're not words that come up um, all the time um, in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, you read of Magog, who was the grandson of Noah, who was the son of Japheth. And Magog is said to have settled in Europe or northern Asia. And Gog is referred to as coming from the land of Magog. That word, uh, it was a proper name to begin with, but it seems like it came to be used as a title for a leader or an enemy of the people of God. I think the Septuagint sometimes translates a chief or a leader as Gog, one of the enemies of God. So it became used as a title, similar to the way, if you think, the way Caesar was originally a name, but then it became a title. Now, in Ezekiel 38, it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Meshach and Tubal, there are ancient Assyrian monuments that speak of these two nations, these two people groups who lived in modern-day Turkey. Again, the similar area of Magog. And what this passage is going to describe, that Gog is going to lead a coalition of armies against Israel. It says there in verse 2, uh, Set thy face against Gog. He says, Look, I want you to behold what's going to happen. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, there are some who would say that the chief prince there, that the word chief, it's Ross, O-R-R-O-S, if I can spell it. And they made the connection with that and say, Well, that's speaking about Russia. And I, I disagree with that personally. Uh, 599 times that word Ross, R-O-S, is used in the Bible in the Old Testament. And 599 times it's referred to as, as head, chief, prince, you know, some area of leadership. Now as well, uh, you know, these nations or these people groups, Meshach and Tubal, they're spoken of three or four more times, and it's never again used with that word Ross, R-O-S. So I believe the chief prince here is being spoken of, and it's mentioned in two people groups along with him initially in these verses. And so God is, in verse 3, says, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. He raises up this coalition. He says, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And so ultimately it's God that's kind of baited them, and he's drawing them. They've made their choice, but God is the one who ultimately is in control. And as well as this, these people groups are from Turkey, and it may involve, you know, the, you know Russia as well, because it is in the north. But then it goes on to describe countries specifically, Persia. Uh, it mentions here Iran, uh, Persia, Libya, Ethiopia. And again, there are some different boundaries than you'd have in these nations in the ancient times, but it's uh, similar for the most part. 
And the reason why some people may be talking about Gog and Magog right now is because who attacked Israel yesterday? Iran. What is Iran? It's Persia. Uh, You know, Persia changed its name to Iran in 1935. Up until that time, it was known as Persia. The name Persia was used by the Greeks, which they took from the name of a region in southwest Iran. But Iran had long been the title by which they had referred to themselves, and it had historic roots. Iran has a long history with Israel. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 2, Daniel lived in Elam, which is in Persia. It's the setting where Esther takes place. It's where Nehemiah begins. Persia was conquered as an empire by Alexander the Great, and it's never really regained that status. It has been ruled by different groups down through the ages, and uh, the modern state of Iran, as it's known now, kind of began in 1501, and then it became an Islamic Republic in 1979. But, you know, it wasn't all that long ago. If you read of Persia in the Bible, you could look on your map, and you'd see Persia. Uh, You know, and so... When it talks here about this attack taking place, well, Persia is speaking of Iran. When you go on further down, it mentions Gomer and all his bands and the house of Togomar and of the north quarters, all his bands and many people with thee. Uh, Gomer is Armenia. uh, Togomar is eastern Turkey. So these are places that we see today. And we want to be careful not to be too specific where the Bible is not. But, you know, H.A. Ironside, going back some 120 years or so, he always believed that one of the great threats to Israel was Turkey. But up until about 15 years ago, Turkey wasn't really a threat. And so a lot of more recent commentators kind of overlooked it, but now Turkey is definitely looking dangerous again. And so these are the nations that are mentioned. When will this happen? We don't know. Uh, you know, the, the, the timing of it is never given. And I would say this, if anybody ever says to you, this is when the rapture is going to happen, don't listen to them ever again. That's one of the most important things is we, the, the Bible doesn't give us dates and times. And I would generally be very cautious. There's few people where you would hear, and you maybe never heard me say that before. There's very few times when I would say, do not listen to this person ever But if someone says the rapture is going to happen on this day and at that time, turn them off, walk away, and never listen to them again. Because there's something fundamentally wrong with them. Uh, The only other time I did that recently is with Stephen Furtick. Uh, He's just a mess up and down. And I posted a picture on Facebook with him the other day with just the ugliest sweater you can imagine. And again, I don't pick on anybody for the sweaters that they wear, apart from my mother. But we have an understanding respect your parents respect your mothers so when i mentioned that it's just a very particular thing with my mother who i love dearly and will be visiting here in the fall don't say a word anyway it's not her sweaters in general it was just a particular sweater anyway it doesn't matter we don't know when any of these things are going to take place I know Emily's going to email her about it tonight. Just you watch. I'm going to hear about it in the morning. Anyway, where is she? We don't know when these things will take place. We don't know exact boundaries for nations. But we do know that there are particular places mentioned here in people, groups, And in verse 7, God says, Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that they are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. They're warned about what is going to happen. Uh, The description in verse 8 is, After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. I just want to read one other verse in connection to this, just back in Ezekiel 37 and verse 21. It says there, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. 
I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. There was a prophecy that they would be brought back into the land. Jeremiah 32 says something very similar. They would be dispersed, but they would be brought back. And that never happened until recent times, uh, back in 1948. And now, again, the timing we don't know, but we know that God promised to bring them back into the land, that they be made one nation. Now look back in Ezekiel 38, verse 11. He says, Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So the the coalition of armies against Israel said, We're going to go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest. And so one thing I would consider with this is that this attack takes place when Israel believes that they're in a place of safety, unwalled villages. And so when we sometimes see things happening, and even yesterday I saw people saying, well, is this the the setting up of Gog and Magog? Well, I don't believe it is. I think the attack takes place at a time when it's considered to have unwalled villages, when their defenses are down. I've mentioned before when I lived in Northern Ireland for the first, for for three years I lived in Northern Ireland when I went to Bible college there and a lot of people never locked their doors because petty crime was minimal. There was next to no petty crime. There were bombings and there were terrorists and paramilitaries and, you know, you had British soldiers on the street and the army was, you know, apparent everywhere, but there was no petty crime. And so people would leave their doors unlocked because they knew for the most part that they were going to be safe. When the walls are not built, when the defenses aren't raised, is when this coalition of armies, Ezekiel seems to say, are going to attack And it goes on to describe other details in this chapter. But I want you to look down to verse 17, where it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in all time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years, that I would bring thee against them? God says, I know exactly who you are. I've been prophesying this. It's been told. And the reason I mentioned that verse is that nothing takes God by surprise. If there's nothing else that you take away from the message tonight, let it be this. God is in control. We don't need to be afraid. We may not understand what God is doing, but we can believe that if we ask that question, what on earth is God doing? God is doing exactly what he has always determined he would do. God is in control and we can find rest and peace in that. When... You continue in verse 18, it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God every man's sword shall be against his brother I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones fire and brimstone a, a very descriptive way there of God saying I will fight for Israel I will defeat the enemy I will be victorious God's actions are going to be that he will defeat that coalition that have come up against Israel. And then in verse 23, he says, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And so God says, the nations are going to see this, and they're going to know that I have done this. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be converted to him but they're not going to be able to argue that something miraculous took place. There will be no uh, explanation other than 
God has done this. And when you continue into chapter 39, again, we'll, we'll skip down a few verses. Uh, if we go to um, verse 6, I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. The unbelieving nations of the world are going to look and they're going to be able to say, you know what, God did this. Now, some of them will believe, but a lot of them are going to pray for the rocks and the hills to fall on them. They'd rather hide from God than turn to God. But Israel are going to begin to see this, and eventually it will come about in Zechariah. It describes that they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for, as for an only son, and they will believe upon him. They'll be saved. So God's actions are going to be a testimony to the world. They're going to be a way of drawing Israel back to himself. And one final thing before we move on, the reason that I believe that this happens before the tribulation or right at the beginning of the tribulation is this. If you go down to verse uh, chapter 39 and verse um, 9, and it says, They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years so that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forests. For they shall burn the weapons with fire. They shall spoil those that spoil them and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord. It shall come to pass on that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and then they shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamangog, and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. So the destroyed weapons and vehicles and whatever else is used by the coalition that comes up against them will take seven years to burn through and get through and dispose of. And for seven months, they're going to be burying the dead from this battle. And so I, I just don't see how this can be the same Gog and Magog that takes place in Revelation chapter 20. So if we turn there now, Revelation 20. The rapture has happened. The church has been taken up to be with the Lord. For seven years, the tribulation has just decimated this world. And then in Re Revelation 19, Jesus returns and uh, he establishes um, his kingdom upon this earth. In Revelation 20, it describes Satan being put into a bottomless pit for a thousand years, and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Then at the end of that, we come to Revelation 20, verse 7. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nation, nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Immediately after this, you read about Satan and the, uh, the uh, enemies of God being thrown into the lake of fire. You have the great white throne judgment. And there's no seven-year period. There's no seven-month period. After this, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And there's no more rebellions, no more war, no more sorrow. Nothing else will take place. And so you have these expected conflicts. And there are some people who believe that these two conflicts are the same. But personally, I don't see that it fits. Uh, with the, the one, you have a period of time afterwards of, you know, years or months. But with this one, you go into eternity. Uh, with, uh, there's no direct mention of Satan in Ezekiel, but there is here in the book of Revelation. And there are the other uh, distinctives that we've seen. And so we have an everlasting covenant with Abraham. We have an expected conflict of the nations of the world going up against Israel. But what I want us to end on this evening is the eternal crown that belongs to the Lord. The book of Revelation, uh, you know, there are many things in the book of Revelation that I find just 
fascinating. And I love to look at it and consider it and read about it. I love to teach about it. It's one of those subjects where, you know, you can just leap from point to point and place to place and, you know, just keep linking together the Bible. But, you know, the book of Revelation is ultimately not about Antichrist. It's not about the mark of the beast. The book of Revelation is is not you know, at its heart about the tribulations, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. And so with everything that happens here, we say, okay, well, it's talking about this, but what does this tell me about Jesus? Well, it's describing this, but what does it tell me about Jesus? We must always go back to Jesus Christ. There are many things, like I said, that I just love to consider about prophecy. But ultimately, we need to end up looking at Jesus. There are several things that I will agree to disagree on. But ultimately, we come back to look together at Jesus Christ. There are some things where, you know, it's just confusing. And I've never yet come up with a a, a satisfying answer for myself. But ultimately, I can look to Jesus and be content that he knows what I do not. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15, Paul writes this, or go back to verse 14. He says, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And so there is so much more here, I'm sure, that we could consider and question and discuss, and I'm happy to do that. But ultimately, we rest in what we do know. We trust Jesus with what we don't know. And while we wait for him to make all things clear, we praise him, we serve him, we witness, we, we continue doing what he has called for us to do. So God has a future for the nation of Israel. The people ethnically connected with Abraham because of the everlasting covenant. There is always going to be wars and rumors of wars until Jesus returns and establishes his peace on earth. And we ought to endeavor to be peacemakers and pray for peace. But there are conflicts prophesied that have yet to happen. And through it all, regardless of it all, because of it all, our focus needs to be kept on Jesus Christ. I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment, but uh, just again, it's a little bit different what we're doing at the moment and the subjects I'm going to be dealing with. So I want to just take a moment. If anybody has any questions, anything they they want to um, share before we go to a closing prayer and a final hymn. And if you have a question afterwards, you can speak to me and we can deal with things that way as well. All right, well, I'll pray, and then we'll have a final hymn, and and then we will uh, be finished for the day. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have given to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us just to rest in you. We do pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. We do look to you for uh, help in that region of the world. We pray primarily for souls to be saved, to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, we think of... Uh, Ukraine and so many other places around the world today where there are wars and conflicts. And Father, we just look forward to that day when uh, you will establish your kingdom upon this earth and there will be a true and lasting peace. Father, while we're here, may we keep our focus upon you, serving you, telling others of you and glorifying your name. And this we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You know, this whole world is, uh, suffers a lot, and there's a lot to look forward to that the world's going to suffer. But it's interesting to me that all the suffering can all be avoided because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. There is power in the blood of Jesus when he shed it on the cross. In number 308, the great sacrifice, stand with me as we sing, Nothing But the Blood. <clears throat> Oh, 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hymn number 308 on the second. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Wonderful. Brother Dave Duncan, would you close for us?